All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to cover how to solve first order circuits with non constant sources. This might sound a little scary at first, but please don't worry. We're going to go through a really nice 10 step recipe to make the math a lot more straightforward. So feel free to follow along with the examples in this video. And as you get more comfortable with the process, you'll find these circuits actually aren't that bad. So here's our goals for today's video. First, we will very briefly review our shortcuts on how to solve RL and RC circuits, or first order circuits with constant sources. In our previous video, we covered some nice shortcuts which make this process quite a bit easier. Then we will solve RL and RC circuits with time-dependent or non-constant sources. We'll see that the procedure is a little bit more complex, but we're going to learn a convenient 10-step recipe in order to help simplify the math. And finally, we'll apply some more shortcuts to help simplify these first order differential equations. And you'll see that if you follow the nice 10 step recipe provided, the math really isn't so bad. Let's go ahead and get started. First, you'll remember last video we introduced first order circuits. And in our previous video, we learned about how to solve first order circuits which contain constant sources. A first order circuit is a circuit that contains one or more sources, one or more resistors. But remember, a first order circuit will contain just one capacitor or just one inductor. We learned that the behavior will be represented by a first order ordinary differential equation as shown in these figures. So in our previous video, we learned a really nice shortcut for solving first order circuits which have constant sources. We learned that if our first order circuit has a constant source, we can use Norton and Thevenin equivalents to make life quite a bit easier. We learned that if we can find the Thevenin equivalent or Norton equivalent, then we can very quickly determine an expression for capacitor voltage or inductor current. These expressions are derived directly from the solution to the first order differential equation for a circuit containing a constant sources. However, if our sources are not constant, this shortcut won't work. Real quick, just for a review, if we have a first order RC circuit with constant sources, remember you can just find the Thevenin an equivalent of the circuit connected to that capacitor and then directly plug into our shortcut equation to find our capacitor voltage. Remember also to determine the time constant tau using our Thevenin and resistance and the capacitance. Similarly, we saw in our previous video that we can solve for the inductor current in an RL circuit if we replace the circuit of interest with its Norton equivalent and substitute in our shortcut equation. Remember in this case our time constant tau is given by our, our inductance divided by the Thevenin resistance. Remember that these shortcuts are very convenient 
but they only work in circuits with constant sources that are not time-dependent. In today's class, we're going to learn how to approach circuits which do have time-dependent sources. Now remember, in our previous video, we also introduced these ideas of complete response, forced response, and natural response. When solving differential equations, remember that we call the full solution to our differential equation to be the complete response. Here that will be our capacitor voltage or inductor current in our circuit. Typically, the complete response is found by summing the forced response and the natural response. Remember that the forced response captures contribution from independent sources, like our constant current or voltage source. This is also known as the particular solution in math class. Then the natural response is our first order circuit's behavior when there are no input sources, or no additional independent sources in that circuit. And this solution is also known as the homogeneous solution. We will learn later in today's video that in order to solve that differential equation for our first order circuits, we solve it by finding the forced response and natural response separately, and then we can add these two together to determine our complete response or solution for the differential equation. Finally, let's review the time constant. The time constant is a very important parameter that comes up when we deal with first order circuits. Remember that the time constant tells us how quickly our circuit will stabilize. The units of the time constant are seconds, And the time constant can be used to help determine how long it will take for our circuit to stabilize. We typically assume that the circuit has stabilized after 5 times tau seconds have passed. So if our time constant is 10 milliseconds, then we will be 99.33% of the way to steady state after 5 tau seconds. Also, we can use the time constant to help us determine whether or not our circuit is stable. You'll remember we learned last time that a first order circuit will be stable only if the time constant and the Thevenin resistance are positive. All right, so let's try this review question. Suppose I have this circuit in my phone camera's flash. My circuit contains a 1 microfarad capacitor. Remember, 1 microfarad is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 regular farads. And I also have a 1000 ohm resistor in that circuit. I'm assuming that my capacitor is initially fully discharged. So initially, BC at time t equals 0 is 0 volts. However, at time t equals 0, I flip this switch. So all of a sudden, I connect my capacitor to that 10 volt source, and my capacitor has a 10 volt voltage applied, and my capacitor begins to charge. So first part of the question asks to find an equation for capacitor voltage for time t is greater than zero. And then the next part asks, how long will it take for that capacitor to charge? Let's try this question using the shortcut equations that we learned in our previous video. So first we want to find the equation for Vc of t 
for time t is greater than zero. Notice that we have a first order circuit with a constant source. So here we can use the shortcut equations that we learned in our previous lecture. So in this case, we know that we can find the Thevenin equivalent. Let's find the Thevenin equivalent of the circuit connected to the capacitor. If we do that, then we know that from our shortcut equations, our capacitor voltage will be equal to VOC, or our Thevenin voltage, plus V of zero minus VOC times E to the negative T over tau. And remember here, tau is our Thevenin and resistance times our capacitance. So notice at time t is greater than zero, let's draw our Thevenin equivalent. The Thevenin equivalent of the circuit connected to our capacitor will look something like this. Remember, we want to find the Thevenin equivalent for time t is greater than zero, because that's the time we're trying to solve for. At time t is greater than zero, we can see that our Thevenin voltage is just going to be 10 volts. And then we can see that our Thevenin resistance, we just have a single resistor in series there, that is going to give us 1000 ohms. So we can go ahead and substitute in our Thevenin voltages and Thevenin resistance. We get 10 volts for VOC. We get 1000 ohms for our Thevenin resistance. We have 10 to the minus 6 farads for capacitance. And we have 0 volts as our initial condition. Remember, we were told our steady state voltage is zero volts for time t is less than zero. And remember, our capacitor voltage cannot change instantaneously. So V of zero is zero. Finally, our time constant tau, if we multiply 1000 by 10 to the minus six, that gives us a tau value of one one thousandth or 0 0.001 seconds. So if we substitute everything in, we are left with Vc of t being equal to 10 minus 10 e to the minus 1000 t. And of course the units here will be volts. In the second part of our question, we are asked, how long will it take for that capacitor to charge? Well, remember in this case, we can estimate time to reach steady state by using five times tau seconds. So here, since tau is 0 0.001 seconds, we need five tau, or 0 0.005 seconds are needed to charge the capacitor. So there you have it. Make sure you keep these shortcut equations handy, because it can really simplify the math for first order circuits with constant sources. 
So while it's fairly straightforward to solve first-order circuits with constant sources, not every first-order circuit is going to have a source that is not time-dependent. And so we also need to figure out how to solve those circuits when we have a non-constant or a time-dependent source. And so to do that, we need to solve the first-order differential equation shown here, where f of t is time-dependent. And so in our case, we need to be able to solve this first-order differential equation for different kinds of f of t. For the purposes of our class, we're going to consider the following three cases. First, we consider the case where we have what's called a unit step source or step source. This is when we have a sudden increase in our voltage or current due to something being powered on. So this simulates a switch or a source being powered on. Powered on or even powered off. Could also have some sort of exponential source where we have something exponentially rising or falling. And then in our third case, we'll consider what happens if we have a sinusoidal source as our f of t. So real quick, before we get into the math, let's just briefly introduce the unit step source and step sources. These may be new for some students, but you'll see they're actually pretty simple to deal with. So typically, in math class or signals class, we use step sources to model sudden, constant changes in current or voltage. So for example, here you could see that initially we're sitting at, say this is a zero volt signal or the signal strength is zero, but at some time t naught, we increase to a new value instantly. So essentially here we are mathematically modeling a vertical or instantaneous change in our signal. Notice that the exact value of the step function at time t equals t naught is undefined. So we were initially for the unit step, we're sitting at zero for time t less than t naught. And once we pass time t naught, we immediately flip and we become magnitude of one. So the unit step is where that value is either zero for time t less than t naught or one for time t greater than t naught. Similarly, we can also have the step function where we're going from some value a to another value b. We don't always have to be going just from zero to one. But this step function is really important because it helps us model these instantaneous changes. So we'll learn more about how to deal with the unit step function a little bit later. Let's return to our equation that we had before. Remember, our goal is we want to solve first order circuits with non-constant sources. Or you can also call them time-dependent sources. So in order to solve first-order circuits with non-constant non sources or time-dependent sources, we need to solve this equation. And so the good news is that this equation is actually really common. And it's actually been solved a lot by smart mathematicians. 
we know that the complete solution to this equation will be of the form x of t is xn of t plus xf of t. Remember here, x of t could be our vc of t or il of t, could be our current or voltage. And we know that that solution will be the sum of our natural response plus a forced response. The natural response is the solution when we have no independent sources in our circuit. It's also known as the homogeneous solution. Then, our forced response is the solution including contributions from those other sources. This is also known as the particular solution. So in order to solve this equation, we have to find both the natural and the forced responses. Then we can add them together in order to find our complete solution. Let's take a look at how we can actually find the natural and forced response. Let's start with the natural response. We can show mathematically that the natural response for our first order circuits will always have this form. And so here, once again, xn of t, the x could be a current or a voltage, depending on what we're trying to solve. And k is a constant. And this will be determined using our initial conditions. And look at that value a. The value a is related to our time constant. And so we can determine this value a using the Thevenin equivalent of our circuit for time t is greater than zero. Just for fun, for those who are interested, I did include the derivation of this expression on the next few slides. If you've taken differential equations class, you've probably seen this before. I'm not going to expect you to be able to derive this natural response, but I do expect that you know how to use this natural response in order to solve the circuits that we're going to look at. So just for your own information, basically to, to determine the natural response, we use this integrating factor method, which may be familiar to you from differential equations class, and we can basically substitute this e to the at expression on both sides. So we multiply everything by that. And this allows us to rewrite our equation in a slightly different form. And this might not seem helpful initially, but if we do multiply by that e to the at expression, it allows us to integrate. And of course, when we integrate an expression containing e, then you know the integral of e is just e, so you know you get some simplifying happening. And if we solve for x of t in this case, we can determine that our natural response is always going to have that k e to the a t term plus some other integral. Once again, I don't expect you to know how to derive this for our class, but you should at least know how to use the result. So finally, we can show that in the case where our forced response f of t is zero, our natural response must equal 
ke to the at because that whole integral vanishes. But then if we actually want to find the force response, we need to actually plug in for this f of t and then solve for x of t. That math can get a little bit nasty, but the good news is some mathematicians have already solved this equation. So for the purposes of our class, we're going to use some shortcuts from the smart mathematicians rather than deriving all the forced responses. Let's go ahead and look at the good news then. The good news is we don't have to integrate this ugly thing. Smart mathematicians have already determined the forced responses under different types of situations. So instead of having to solve that integral, we can use some shortcuts. And so let's use some shortcuts to help us figure out what our forced response will be. So to find the forced response, some smart mathematicians have already helped us with some really important details. We can show mathematically that if our input f of t, or our non-constant source, has the following forms, we know our forced response will have the form in the right column of this table. So the idea here is rather than having to take that integral and, and derive f of t and derive your forced response, here's what you do. You look in this table and you guess the form of our forced response based on the table. For example, if I have an exponential source in my circuit, I would guess that my forced response has the form xf of t is n times e to the minus bt, where this b matches the b in my source that I've been given. So the idea is you guess the form of your forced response based on whatever type of source you have initially. Then, once you guess this forced response, you plug this guess into our differential equation and you can solve for these constants n, a, or b. So all of this might still sound kind of complex and confusing. And it might be a little bit confusing and complex at first. But to help everyone, I've put together a recipe for you. This 10-step recipe will help you solve first-order circuits with non-constant sources. Please follow this recipe. It will greatly simplify the process of solving those first-order circuits. You're certainly welcome to use other approaches for solving differential equations. You know, if you know Laplace transform and other techniques, those are also valid and they can certainly be used. But I personally find that the approach shown in this recipe can actually greatly simplify the solving process. And make sure you practice this approach a few times on your own. You'll find once you've done this recipe a few times, the process will make a lot more sense and it will get a lot easier. So I highly recommend that you practice the examples that we're gonna do together in this lecture. And you'll find that once you go through the examples and follow this recipe, the whole process will make a lot more sense. Let's briefly describe each step of this recipe, and then we'll spend the rest of our class doing two examples that'll help you understand how to apply this approach 
and how to solve first-order circuits with non-constant sources. So our first step is to verify that we actually have an RC or RL circuit. We want to make sure that we actually have a first order circuit because we're actually going to learn about some other circuits like second order circuits that need a different recipe. So make sure we actually have a first order circuit before applying this recipe. If you don't have a first order circuit, then you'll want to use a different approach. So remember, you need to have one or more sources, one or more resistors, and only one inductor or only one capacitor. Next step is to identify your source type. So you might have a step source, a constant, maybe a sinusoidal or an exponential source. These are the only source types that I expect you to know for this class. Next, you'll want to draw your circuit at time t is less than zero. So here we're assuming that there's some disturbance that happens at time t equals zero. So that is where we get this t less than zero from. You'll want to look at your circuit when time t is less than zero and use that to determine your initial conditions. Remember, initial condition here would be your current or voltage at time t equals zero. Again, it depends if you're trying to solve for voltage, it'll be your voltage. If you're trying to find current, it will be your current at time zero. Step four is the fun part. In step four, you're going to draw the circuit for time t is greater than zero. This is after that disturbance or after that change is happening. And you'll write a differential equation that relates your inductor or capacitor to that non-constant source when time t is greater than zero. So that might sound a little scary. You need to write a differential equation. But thankfully, in order to do that, you generally just need to apply Kirchhoff's laws in order to relate the inductor current or capacitor voltage to the non-constant source. It's often also helpful to have toolbox equations handy as well. Remember, for example, that I of t equals c dv of t dt and our inductor current is L di of t dt. So often these toolbox equations are also needed in order to simplify the circuit. If you have a really ugly circuit, you might also want to find the Thevenin and equivalent of the circuit connected to your inductor or capacitor before you start applying Kirchhoff's laws. But usually, once you apply Kirchhoff's laws and use our toolbox equations for inductor or capacitor behavior, you'll end up with a differential equation in our desired form. Once you have found the differential equation in this form, the rest of the recipe is easy. Once you've derived that differential equation, all you need to do is solve it. And we know that the solution will be our natural response plus our forced response. So all you need to do is first find our natural response. And we know the natural response for that equation is always going to be ke to the minus at. So here you just need to determine your a and use your given information, such as Thevenin and equivalent, capacitance, or inductance. Once you've found the natural response, you just need to find your forced response. So your forced response, again, will be found by guessing the forced response for your source type. Remember, you choose your guess based on this table.
So when you make your guess, you want to recognize what kind of source you have that is non-constant and use the table in our notes based on the non-constant sources type. And again, you also want to look at this f of t, and that will give you the form that you want to use. Then finally, you plug in your guess of x f of t into that differential equation that you found in step 5. That will help you determine any constants in your forced function. Once you find those constants in your forced response, so that would be this n or a and b, then all that's left is to write your complete solution. Once you have your complete solution, you can determine k, this is the constant in your natural response, So remember, you use the initial conditions and your complete solution to determine k. You don't want to just plug into natural or forced response. You have to plug into the complete solution in order to correctly find k. Once you've found that k value, then your complete solution is finished and you have solved the equation. All that's left is to solve for any remaining unknowns as required. So this recipe might seem kind of frightening and complex, and really the, the whole purpose is to guide you through these problems. Once you've solved this recipe a few times on your own, it will make a lot more sense. So let's spend the rest of this video doing a couple examples to help you get familiar with the recipe. Please do follow along. Follow this recipe step by step, and you'll see that it will help lead us along the correct path to our solution. Let's start with our first example. Here we have a first order circuit, and notice we have an exponential source. We're being asked to find the current through our inductor, so our current I L of T, for time T is greater than zero, and we have a 10 volt source on the left side of our circuit. But at time t equals zero, we flip a switch to basically turn off that source. And instead, this other source on the right turns on. Notice here, we have that u of t here. Remember, u of t is the unit step function. Remember, u of t equals 0 for time t is less than 0, but u of t equals 1 for time t is greater than 0. What that means is that this source will be equal to 10 e to the minus 2t for time t is greater than 0, and it equals 0 for time t is less than 0. So if you see a u of t expression like this, just make sure you interpret it correctly. At time t equals 0, our source here has no voltage. But at time t is greater than 0, our voltage will be 10 e to the minus 2t volts. Let's go ahead and try solving this circuit using the 10 step recipe that we just covered. The first step is to verify that we have an RC or RL circuit. The reason for this is we just want to use the right tool for the job. And we can see in this case that we do indeed have an RL circuit because we have an inductor and inductor sources and resistors. From our recipe, the next step is to identify our source type. 
So in this case, you want to be a little careful because there is a u of t there, but our source, the behavior, is exponential because we have e to the something t. The u of t just tells us that we're equal to 0 for time t less than 0, equal to 1 for t greater than 0. So our behavior is exponential. We need to know the source type later when we try to guess our forced response. Our third step is to draw the circuit at time t is less than zero. And we want to find our initial condition. In this case, our initial condition should be our inductor's current at time zero. So since we are trying to find, so we are looking for I L of T, the initial condition that we need initial condition we need is I L of zero. So let's draw the circuit at time t is less than zero. So notice at time t is less than zero, our switch is closed. It has not yet been opened. We've got a 5 ohm resistor. And notice what happens. Notice the inductor is at steady state. Remember, we assume that at time t is less than zero, the inductor is at steady state. That means that the inductor can be replaced with a short. So here you see I have replaced our inductor with a short. And finally, let's go ahead and draw the rest of our circuit. We've got a 4 ohm resistor on this side, and notice this voltage source here, 10 e to the minus 2t u of t. Remember, u of t is equal to 0 for time t is less than 0. So this source is actually a 0 volt source at time t is less than 0. So therefore, because of the short, our circuit actually simplifies considerably. And notice, we're left with something like this. Notice that because of the short, nothing flows through the 4 ohm or 0 volt source. And we just have a 10 volt source and 5 ohm resistor. So what is I L of zero? Well, we can find it by Ohm's law. Notice in this case, I L of zero is just 10 volts over five ohms or two amperes. So we have just completed step three of our recipe. Let's move on to step four. In step four of our recipe, we need to draw the circuit at time t is greater than zero. Remember previously, we looked at time t less than zero, but now we need the circuit at time t is greater than zero. And our goal here is to write a differential equation which relates the time-dependent source
and to relate that time-dependent source to our inductor or capacitor. So let's now draw what our circuit looks like at time t is greater than zero. So notice what we have here. So we have the similar circuit as before, except now our switch is open. So no current flows through the open part of the circuit. And so essentially, what we're left with is a circuit that looks like this. So notice essentially what happened is at time t is greater than zero, our time-dependent source has turned on because remember, for time t is greater than zero, u of t equals one. So this right-hand source is now powered on. And now current is only flowing through the right-hand portion of my circuit. So I obtain the circuit shown here. So remember what our goal is. We want to find an equation relating the time-dependent source to our inductor, in this case, to our inductor current, I L of T. Is there an equation in our toolbox that would relate all the things in this nice loop to I L of T? What equation in our toolbox is good for getting equations around closed loops? If you're thinking of using Kirchhoff's voltage law here, that would be a great idea. Let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. I'm going to go ahead and walk clockwise around. I'm sorry, counterclockwise around in this case. And if I apply my bank account convention from lecture five, I have plus 10 e to the minus 2t volts minus the voltage across my 4 ohm resistor minus the voltage across my inductor. And we know that must sum to zero. Right, well, so we know that. Well, we need to relate all this stuff to our inductor current I L of T. Well, how can we relate this stuff to inductor current? Well, we know that the current going through our 4 ohm resistor is just I L of T, so the voltage across our 4 ohm resistor is just 4 times I L of T, just by Ohm's law. Next we have the voltage across our inductor. We need to relate the voltage of our inductor, V L of T, to I L of T. You might remember in our toolbox, we know that V L of T is equal to L times D I L of T DT. Okay, well, if we do that, look what happens. That's starting to look a little more like a first order differential equation. And we were told that our inductance is 1 Henry. We can go ahead and simplify. We can determine that we have dil of t dt plus 
4 i l of t equals 10 e to the minus 2 t. We have found in step 5, we have found the differential equation in our desired form. Remember, we want to get an equation of the form dx of t dt plus ax of t equals f of t. So you want to make sure you don't have any constants in front of the derivative term. Believe it or not, we have just completed the hardest part of this question. The most challenging part is typically deriving the expression for the differential equation. Once you've found the differential equation, the rest of the problem is just substitution and solving the differential equation. Let's go ahead and solve this thing. So to solve our differential equation, we need to find the forced response and the natural response. In step six of our recipe, we find our natural response. Here I'm gonna call my natural response I L comma N of T. So it's my inductor current with little n for natural. We know from the smart mathematicians that our natural response must be equal to K E to the minus A T. So this is directly from our recipe. And we know that our value A is going to be equal to one over tau, which is our time constant, or one over Thevenin resistance times capacitance, or Thevenin resistance divided by inductance. So here we need to find A. So in this case, we know L is equal to one Henry, was our Thevenin and resistance? Well, we need to look back at our Thevenin and resistance for time t is greater than zero. We can see for time t is greater than zero, our inductor was connected to a 4 ohm resistor and our time-dependent source. So if we turn off that time-dependent source, we can conclude that our Thevenin and resistance must be four ohms. So this is obtained by looking at the Thevenin equivalent of our circuit connected to that inductor. Here we determine that the Thevenin and resistance must be four ohms. So therefore we determine A is equal to four ohms divided by one Henry or just four. That means our natural response I L N of T is K E to the minus four T. Don't worry about K just yet. We're gonna solve for K in step nine. Our next step is to find the forced response. And here I'm gonna call my forced response I L comma F of T. F is for forced. To find the forced response, we need to make a guess. We need to guess the form of the forced response based on the type based on the source type. And from our differential equation, we 
we know that f of t is equal to 10 e to the minus 2t. This is an exponential source. And you'll remember, if we want to find the forced response of the exponential source, we want to guess that our forced response will have the form n e to the minus b t, where b is the same coefficient in front of t as our source contained, and n is a constant. So here, let's guess that our il comma f of t is equal to n e to the minus 2t. And this is based on the table. And notice we choose the minus 2 as our coefficient in order to match the, the f of t in our in our differential equation. All right, so now that we've guessed our forced response, we need to plug our forced response in we plug our forced response n e to the minus 2t in to our differential equation. So remember, we had the differential equation dil of t dt plus 4 il of t equals 10 e to the minus 2t. So we plug this expression into our differential equation and solve for the constant n. Let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to just take this expression and substitute it in wherever the il appears. We get d dt of n e to the minus 2t plus 4 times n e to the minus 2t equals 10 e to the minus 2t. If we take the derivative, that gives us negative 2 n e to the negative 2t plus 4 n e to the minus 2t equals 10 e to the minus 2t. If you compare coefficients, we can combine like terms and see that 2n e to the minus 2t equals 10 e to the minus 2t. Therefore, n, that constant, must equal 5. Therefore, our forced response, il comma f of t, is just going to be 5 e to the minus 2t. Notice we now have our forced response and our natural response. We know that the complete solution is the sum of our forced response and natural response. In step 9, we find our complete response, or our solution, by summing the natural and forced response. So in this case, we know that IL of t, our inductor current, it must be equal to the sum of our natural response, which is Ke to the minus 4t, plus our forced response, which is 5e to the negative 2t. Notice we need to find k.
And to do this, we use the initial condition and our complete response. So make sure you plug the initial condition in to the complete response. And then you, all you have to do is solve for k. So in this case, our initial condition from back in step three, our initial condition is IL of zero is equal to two amperes. So therefore, we can say But if we substitute the initial condition into our complete response, we can say that two amperes must equal Ke to the minus four times zero plus five E to the negative two times zero. We know that E to the zero power is one, so we can say that two is K times one plus five times one. Basically, two is equal to k plus five, so k must be negative three. Finally, we can substitute k to get our solution. And here we determine that I L of t our complete solution is equal to negative three e to the negative four t plus five e to the minus two t. And our units here will be amperes. And of course this solution is four time t is greater than zero when our time dependent source was turned on. So as you can see, this recipe does have quite a few steps, but if you follow each step carefully, it will lead you to the correct answer. And while this process might seem a bit long and scary when you first try it, I promise you that once you do a few more examples of this process, it will get a lot easier. So I highly recommend that you go back through this example and the other examples provided to you in order to get comfortable with this process. It really does get easier once you've done some more examples. This last example is a fun one because I would like to revisit our question of the day from the beginning of this video. In the beginning of our video, we solved this question using our shortcut method. I would like to show you that we get the same result. We get the same result as the shortcut if we follow the 10 step recipe. So of course, in this case, because we could have used the shortcut on this question, the easier approach is to use the shortcut for constant sources. But in this case, let's go ahead and try this question using our full 10 step recipe. And notice because we are flipping a switch in our example, we can model our voltage source in this circuit as 10 U of T or as a step source because we know that at time t is less than zero, our switch was on the right side and we had no voltage, but at time t is greater than zero, we flipped our switch and we have 10 volts. So let's go ahead and try our question of the day, but now treating it as a circuit with a step source. And you'll see that if we follow our 10-step recipe carefully, 
we're going to get the exact same result as we did at the beginning of the class. So let's start with the first step of our recipe. First step of our recipe is to verify that we have an RL or RC circuit. And in this case, yes, we do. We have an RC circuit this time. Second step is to identify our source type. And in this case, we see that we actually have a step source because we're treating the switch and our voltage source as the step source 10 U of T. Our third step is to find our initial conditions. And in this case, we want to find our initial condition for our capacitor voltage Vc of t. So we need to draw the circuit for time t is less than zero. And if we do that, notice what we get. So at time t is less than zero, our switch is on the right-hand side. And the only thing we have in our circuit is that 1,000 ohm resistor and our capacitor. So in this case, the Thevenin and equivalent connected to our capacitor is going to have no voltage. There's going to be no voltage across our capacitor VC. So we can say that VC is zero must be zero volts. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next step. So our next step is to draw our circuit at time t is greater than zero. And remember, this time we want to actually determine some expression and a differential equation which relates our capacitor voltage in this case. Remember, we're trying to solve for Vc of t. We want to relate Vc of t to our time-dependent source. Which in this case is that 10 volt source at time t is greater than zero. So at time t is greater than zero, we have our 10 volt source and our switch is flipped and remember now because our switch is flipped we have a 1000 ohm resistor and our 10 volt source with our capacitor connected to it we're no longer at steady state so we know that there's going to be some time dependent behavior we cannot ignore our capacitor or replace it with an O. So we need to get some equation relating Vc of t to our 10 volt source. Do we have any tool in our toolbox that would be good to apply around this closed loop? Oh, we have a really nice closed loop. So if we have a nice closed loop like this, let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. And so I'm going to go ahead and walk clockwise around. 
and I can determine that I have plus 10 volts minus my capacitor voltage, Vc of t, minus the voltage across my 1000 ohm resistor, and all of that must sum to zero. All right, well, now I need to get everything in terms of Vc of t. That way I can write my differential equation. So we need to get this equation in terms of only Vc of t and our, our voltage source. So I need to replace V1000 ohms with something else. Well, I know that the voltage across my 1000 ohm resistor would also be equal to 1000 I of T, where I of T is my current going through that circuit. How could we relate I of T? I of T to V of T for a capacitor. Is there a tool in our toolbox that could relate I of T to V of T? How about I of T equals C dVc of t dt. Notice if we do that, notice what we get. All of a sudden, everything's in terms of Vc of t. And we know, of course, that our capacitance here was given as one microfarad, or 10 to the minus 6 farads. So we can also plug in 10 to the minus 6 for our capacitance. If we rearrange and simplify, we end up getting, we have minus 1,000 times 10 to the negative 6. So if we go ahead and rearrange there, we're going to get in this case, 10 to the minus 3 dVc of t dt. Then we have plus Vc of t equals 10. So again, I'm just rearranging here. And finally, I want to get rid of this constant. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 1,000. to get rid of this constant. And if I do that, I'm going to end up with dVc of t dt plus 1000 Vc of t equals 10,000. This is my step five. I obtained my differential equation in my desired form. Let's go ahead and move on to the next step. Remember, the hardest part is to find that differential equation. Once we find the differential equation, all we have to do is solve it. So to solve, we need to first find the natural response. And to find the natural response, well, we know that Vc comma n, if we call that our natural response, we know the natural response must be equal to k e to the minus a t. Remember, a is equal to 1 over tau, or 1 over r t times our capacitance. And remember, this a is also equal 
to the coefficient in our differential equation. So in fact, one other nice way of finding a is just to look at your differential equation and see what coefficient is in front of your vc of t. So here we can determine that our value a is equal to 1000, either by looking at our differential equation or using 1 over rt times c. So therefore, our natural response is just going to be ke to the minus 1000 t. Our next step is to find our forced response. So we need to guess based on the source type and f of t. In this case, the f of t in our differential equation is a constant. Since we have a constant or step source, we guess that our forced response, we'll call it vc comma f of t, we're going to guess that our forced response is equal to a constant n. Our next step is to substitute our forced response into our differential equation and solve for the constant. In this case, we'll solve for n. So to do that, we just go d dt of n plus 1000 times n. That must equal 10,000. So again, I'm just literally plugging in my constant n into our differential equation from step 5. Time derivative of a constant goes to 0, so I determine that 1000 n must equal 10,000. That means n must be 10, and my forced response is just a constant 10. Notice that I have now found both my natural and my forced response. I'm now ready to get my complete solution. Remember, my complete solution is equal to my natural response plus my forced response. So in this case, my capacitor voltage is going to be my natural response, which we found was Ke to the minus 1000 T, plus my forced response, which was just 10. But I'm not quite finished. I need to find K. Remember, to find k, I use the initial condition. So remember, from step 3, we determined that Vc of 0 is equal to 0 volts. So if I substitute that in, 
I can determine that zero must equal to k e to the minus 1,000 times zero plus 10. That means zero equals k plus 10. So k must equal negative 10. Finally, if I substitute that back in, I determine my final answer. I determine that Vc of t is equal to 10 minus 10e to the minus 1000t units or volts. And notice, this is the same result as we got using the shortcut. So once again, the shortcut is really convenient for first order differential equations with constant sources. But you can see, even if we go through the trouble to solve the differential equation without our shortcut, we would get the same result. So one other thing that I'd like to emphasize once again is the value A can be found from the equivalent circuits Thevenin and resistance, or just check the differential equation. Because as you saw in our example we just did, we determined we can determine A directly from the coefficient in front of the x of t term. So you can find the coefficient a using either of those approaches. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up here for today. Hopefully now solving first order RL and RC circuits is something that is starting to make a little bit more sense. The solution for circuits with time-dependent sources is a little bit more tricky because we have to solve that first-order differential equation. But make sure you follow the recipe and shortcuts provided. You'll see that these shortcuts will greatly simplify the process of solving the differential equations, and they'll make life a lot easier. I highly recommend that you go back through the examples we did and try following the 10-step recipe on your own. Make sure you're able to get the same results that we came up with. Once you practice the 10-step recipe a few times, you'll find that it gets a lot easier and that it starts making a lot more sense. So please take the time to practice these examples and you'll find that RC and RL circuits, even with time-dependent sources, are really not too bad. It can actually be quite satisfying when you finally reach the end of the recipe and have successfully determined the solution. Please feel free to reach out if you have any further questions, and we'll see you in the next video.